go to prayer. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you again. It is always an honor to be welcomed into the presence of the Almighty. Thank you, God, for this committed, benevolent, powerful, just ever persistent and ever present love. I thank you, God, for brothers and sisters who you have allowed to taste and receive a hunger and thirst for righteousness. For you have promised that you will fill this hunger and thirst. God, thank you for the opportunity to come together and commune Sabbath after Sabbath. And we thank you for the special words of life that you prepare for us time and time again. God, I just plead that you would please humble our hearts, that you would please purify us deep, deep within, that you would please cleanse us of all desire to lean upon self, that we would learn to lean upon Jesus in everything. In a mighty way, God, I plead that you would take charge of our lives, of our hearts, of our being, and allow yourself to shine so brightly that the world will come to know who Jesus is. Thank you, God, for giving us the opportunity to be called your people in these last days. And I pray, God, that as we worship you together as one family, that all of our hearts will be kindled with the fire of heaven to know that God loves us more than anything. Thank you for ushering us into your holy presence. And Lord, as we worship you together, may you draw our hearts upwards and deeper and further in thee. I pray for brothers and sisters joining from around the world that your Holy Spirit will just pick all of us up from our caves of despair and doubt and worry and anxiety and teach us to look to Jesus and live for there is no other way to live. Bless us, Lord. Friends, on this side where it's still the Sabbath, I pray that you would allow us to taste that fullness of the Sabbath. Friends who have already entered into a new week, I pray that they may go forward in the power of the Lord of the Sabbath. Thank you, God, for what you are about to do. We praise thee in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Welcome again, friends, and uh, what a precious, precious opportunity to know how much God desires for us to be banding together as God's special people in times like these. And we just give God glory for repeatedly bringing us back to this very sacred message of the sanctuary where God is instructing us in his way. And we've been looking at some very grand themes in the sanctuary. And now we've come to the point where we're seeing some, we've gone through all the articles, we've looked at the importance uh, and now we're beginning to see like deeper truths connected to the sanctuary experience. Now, if you were with us last week, we were on the third part uh, speaking about the sanctuary life, how there were questions being raised, sanctuary life questions that were being raised before us from the sanctuary, asking us if we are allowing God to be visible to the world through us. Are we allowing God to meet with people through our lives? And are we truly setting ourselves aside to be a special, a set-apart people, a sanctuary for God that he may dwell among us? Those are questions that we were facing. And so we're going to go forward today. Our, our, our theme for study today is from communion to atonement. That's, that's our subject for today. And I just pray that God will just richly, richly speak to us. We're going to see something very special that is going to be highlighted to us today through our reflection. And God's wanting to help us understand and appreciate this beauty of the sanctuary. To begin with, I want to point out as been our, has been our theme text in Exodus 25.8, where God says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. We've studied that together. That if my people are willing to be a set apart people from the word sanctuary, the word sanctify, which means to be set apart for a holy purpose. 
And God was saying to his people, not just to build a physical structure, what God was saying was, are you willing to be a people set apart for holiness? If you are, God said, I will dwell among you. Bible tells us that really means I want to dwell not just in one of the rooms of your houses. I just don't want to be a, 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 a visitor in your house or locked up in one room in your house. I really want to be in you. That's, of course, what the Lord points out in 2 Corinthians 6.16, where he says, and I will be in you. I will walk in you. And that's how I will be your God. And you will be my people. So this is God's desire. This is the purpose of the sanctuary. We've been looking at this. This is the golden cord that we see from Genesis to Revelation, where God highlights his desire to just be with his people. That's the push. That's the core message of the sanctuary. Today, we go to explore further God's desire through the sanctuary for us. To begin with, I want to highlight to you the grand theme of the sanctuary. What was the sanctuary for originally? That's what I want to point out. In Exodus 25, 22, God highlights, he says, there in the sanctuary, I will meet with thee. Focus on those words. I will commune with thee. It will be a place of what? Of communion, of fellowship. I want to meet you. This will be a meeting place for us from above the mercy seat. In other words, I'm going to meet you in mercy. I won't be meeting you. We'll be coming together, not for me to strike you down. I want to commune with you in mercy. I shall embrace you for my love endureth forever. My mercies endure forever. God says from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things, which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel, I will meet with you. I will fellowship with you. I will give to you my will, my directions, my commandments. I want to be with you. His desire has not changed. In Exodus 29, verse 43, the Lord says, There I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. Now, wait a minute. He's saying, I will meet with you there, and where I will be, there there will be sanctification. Isn't that what the Lord says also to his people when he says, I am the Lord that sanctifies you. For where I will be, there it, it will be a place that will be set apart. There will be the experience of sanctification. Hence his invitation, if you allow me to be in you, you will be sanctified by my glory. Notice, friends, again, the purpose of the sanctuary. I want to meet with you. I want to commune with you, have fellowship with you. God says there in the sanctuary, I will meet the children of Israel. This is God declaring his desire, his heart, revealing his purpose. Friends, I, I want to posit to you, this was actually the original purpose of the sanctuary. Let's take our thoughts all the way up to the heavenly sanctuary. And I want you to notice with me in the book of Isaiah, you'll need your Bibles for this one. In Isaiah chapter 6, I'd like you to notice this marvelous throne room experience that the prophet is given. In Isaiah 6, notice what Isaiah beholds. Isaiah 6, verse 1. The Bible says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. You heard me share on this text before. I like it because Isaiah is saying, the earthly king of the land had passed away. But praise God, I still see God on the throne, still seated on the throne. I don't know what you may be going through, dear friend. Perhaps there's a crisis in your life. Perhaps it's a financial breakdown. Perhaps it's a mental breakdown. Perhaps it's a relational breakdown. Perhaps it's an economic breakdown. I don't know what the breakdown is. I don't know what is torn down and, 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 and just down shattered to pieces. The good news is that God is still on the throne. Isaiah is assured the king of the land may have died, but the king of kings is still on the throne. I want to thank God for Sister Dale uh, sharing that we should, I should point us all back to that king of kings. And there it is in our, in our opening statements. Isaiah 
And he's saying, look at God. He is still in control. He is still on the throne. As Isaiah beholds, it's, it's, a, it's a unique experience for Isaiah himself, for very few have had the opportunity to, to see God seated on his throne. Let's keep reading. Verse 2. It stood Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. With twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. Notice the unworthiness this angel feels in the presence of the God. As he covers his face, his feet feels unworthy to be in the presence of the Almighty. Verse 3 of Isaiah 6, the Bible says, And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The Bible tells us how people are rejoicing, how angels are rejoicing. They're singing glory. They're singing holiness to the Lord. The whole earth is full of his glory. The Bible tells us in verse 4, the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. It's so beautiful. We see a picture of angels gathering together in the sanctuary of God, in the throne room of God. We recognize from the book of Daniel, for instance, that there are 10,000 times, 10,000 that are ministering before the throne of God. Let's go there. It's a marvelous text. If you have your Bibles now, friends, Daniel chapter 7, and notice what the Bible says. Uh, verse Daniel chapter 7, verse 9 ends by saying, His throne was like a fiery flame, his wheels as burning fire. Verse 10 says, A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. Friends, when we go way back in, in the past, when we go way back into looking into the purpose of the sanctuary. You see, friends, we usually associate the sanctuary with a place that deals with sin. Follow me closely now. Often we look at the sanctuary and our perception of the sanctuary is this is a place that was put together to deal with our sin. If we really study, friends, that isn't really the case. The purpose of establishing the sanctuary was not to deal with sin. For the question is, in the heavenly sanctuary, where angels are coming and worshiping God before the entrance of sin, what were they doing then? It's not like the angels were not worshiping God before the entrance of sin. It isn't like that. So even before the entrance of sin, this is an important point, angels were coming into the sanctuary. They were in the presence of God. So what was the heavenly sanctuary for if it wasn't dealing with sin? It is exactly as what we are reading. Let's go revisit those texts again. God says, there I will meet with thee. I will commune with thee. God says, I will meet with the children of Israel and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. The Bible reveals to us that this was a place of communion where the angelic host came together into the heavenly sanctuary. It wasn't a place to deal with the, the darkness of sin. It was a place to celebrate, rejoice, and fellowship, and, and just, just magnify the Lord. That's what this place was really intended to be. Follow me, friends. This was the original intent of the sanctuary. In fact, pay close attention. The sanctuary... It was God's holy dwelling. I hope you're catching that. This is where God's presence is, all right? So if this is where God's presence is, and this is where people are coming to meet with God, to commune with God, all right? That's, that's what's happening here. On the other hand, we find sin. While God's holy presence is binding people together to worship him, Sin, on the other hand, by its very nature, separates human beings from God. Isaiah 59 verse 2. Isn't that what the Bible tells us? That our iniquities have separated us from God. Follow me closely then. God's dwelling is a place where his redeemed people would come to meet with him and worship him. This is God, his holiness. A sin, on the other hand, 
while holiness is binding you together, sin is separating you from God. In a sense, then, friends, it could be said that sin and sanctuary are therefore, in essence, mutually exclusive. Sin separates, sanctuary brings people together. This is very odd. How, how can we say that these two are the same thing? Are we, are we following together? How can we say the sanctuary is a place where God can deal with sin when sin separates, but the sanctuary was a place to bring people together? Here is unification in the sanctuary. This is separation in sin. How can they be working together? I hope we understand this divine concept. The Bible is helping us appreciate, friends, the original intent of the sanctuary was a place where God's people can come together, commune with him, fellowship with him, and grow in a deeper relationship with him. The question is, how then did this place of communion turn into a place of atonement? Ah, there is our theme. That's what we're wanting to study today. How did the sanctuary go from a place of communion to atonement? That's what God wants us to understand. And that's what I invite you to study with me, friends, is God reveals this beautiful experience and something that we need to really cherish and, and just, just take to heart because it's so beautiful. The point of this experience, the reality of this experience, takes us all the way back to the book of Exodus. You know this. We've been looking at this since we're looking at the sanctuary quite a bit. There's a, there's a point in the Israelite experience that really highlights this whole experience for us. The way in and the manner in which the sanctuary and its services came to deal with the problem of sin is highlighted by this particular experience of the children of Israel. You would know the story. Moses is on top of Mount Sinai and the Israelites down in the valley have been worshiping the golden calf. They've broken the covenant they just made with God in Exodus 19. We've studied together, I believe, how God had declared a marriage covenant with Israel. Let's rewind again as we recapitulate, re-establish what we've been studying. The book of Exodus has how many sections? It's got particularly three sections. And in these three sections, the first section the first 18 chapters deal with the God's people, God's people being delivered. First 18 chapters based on deliverance. Chapters 19 through 24 are chapters that deal with the covenant. Chapters 25 through 40 are the chapters that deal with sanctuary. How do we see this in the light of God's relationship? The first 18 chapters, God delivers his bride, the woman he loves. He delivers her from that bondage. Only after the lover God has proved to his bride that he is an able God, he's able to rescue her from the, the clutches of the enemy, he then, having revealed and, and, and proved himself to her, he now proposes marriage in Exodus 19. Are you with me? In Exodus 19, he says, will you accept this covenant? If you therefore keep my covenant, you will be a peculiar people to me above all the people. That's the covenant, the marriage covenant God is proposing and Israel accepting when they said all that the God says we will do. Just like a man and a woman at the altar say, I do. Israel responded similarly. So God delivers, God proposes marriage, the covenant is sealed. And then from chapters 25 through 40, God presents a unique marital concept. Now that I've delivered you, and now that I've married you, Exodus 25, 8, can I now live with you? Are you catching this? I really like this. And I know I've said this multiple times, but I really like this. I've delivered you. I've married you. So Exodus 25, 8, if you build me a sanctuary, I want to stay with you. Now I have the legal marital right to be with you. Now, Exodus 19, then, they had created a marriage covenant. By the time we get to Exodus 32, when God is giving the specifics for his house with his bride, this is rough. Chapters 25 through 40 primarily deal with the sanctuary instructions. So while God is designing, giving to his people the design for their home together, Israel is busy, already busy, out there chasing 
a, another lover. What a tragic story, friends. Now, from the mountaintop, God witnessed what Israel was doing. And God was just, just filled with such brokenness of heart. Hear his words. The Lord said unto Moses in Exodus 32, verse 7. He says, go get thee down for thy people. Notice how he's addressing them. He's saying, these are your people, which you have brought out of the land of Egypt. They have corrupted themselves. Now, this is becoming serious. God says to his people, you brought them out. And because you brought them out, these are your people. Look at how they have corrupted themselves. Now, two very important concepts come highlighted at this juncture. First being, Israel has separated themselves from God by pursuing a, pay, a pagan God, like they're worshiping a golden calf, forsaking the one true living God. They've separated themselves from God, and that's why, because they've separated themselves by their choice to worship this golden calf, therefore, God addresses them as, Moses, these are your people. Because their behavior is absolutely not like my wife. So Moses, these are your people. So first truth, Israel has separated itself from God. Therefore, God refers to them as Moses' people. Now they belong to Moses, who God says, you are the one who brought them out of, out of the land of Egypt. And the covenant relationship with Yahweh has now been violated by the people. We notice even in even in scripture, while God says he hates divorce, he says that marriage bed when it is defiled is a ground for divorce. It's not mandatory to be divorced, but it is a ground for divorce. And that's what Israel has done. They've defiled the spiritual bond between the two. They have defiled the marriage bed between them and God. Being God's bride, they have gone out after a pagan God, a pagan deity worshiping a golden that's what we see established here. And then God is, God is pointing this out to us and we want to pay attention. So notice, notice, firstly, Israel has separated themselves from God by virtue of how they're worshiping this, this golden calf. Secondly, we recognize that they who have now violated this, this, this bond, this, this marital relationship with God. Secondly, the people, the Lord says, they have corrupted themselves. Now, it's really vital that we pay very close attention to that word corrupted. Because the same verb, the same Hebrew verb that is translated here as corrupted is used elsewhere in Leviticus 22. Come there with me. In Leviticus 22, God is speaking about animals that are brought as a sacrifice into the tabernacle. And notice what God says, Leviticus 22, 21. Whosoever offereth a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord to accomplish his vow or a free will offering in a beeves or a sheep, it shall be perfect to be accepted. There shall be no what? There shall be no blemish therein. Now, it's vital to note that in speaking of the sacrifices, that God's people will be bringing into the tabernacle. God says they have to be perfect. They can have no blemish in them. Let's keep reading. And in the, in the following text, uh, verse 24, the Lord says, You shall not offer unto the Lord that which is bruised, that which is crushed, that which is broken or cut. Neither shall you make any offering thereof in your land, neither from a stranger's hand, Shall you offer the bread of your God of any of these? Because their what? Their corruption is in them and blemishes be in them. They shall not be accepted for you. Leviticus 22, 25. Now God says, because there is a corruption in them. These, these animals can't be offered. These offerings will not be accepted because there is corruption in them. There are defects in them. Hence, God describes that as corruption. They're defiled and they can't be offered. What I want you to notice is that word corruption here referring to these defective offerings is the same word that God had used for Israel earlier in Exodus 32 when God says now they have corrupted themselves. I hope you're seeing the connection. 
because of the defilement of the sacrificial offerings, God said they're corrupt and can't come into the tabernacle. In a similar way, now God is referring to Israel and saying, Moses, Israel has now corrupted themselves, just like the animals, the, the sacrificial animals can be corrupted. Israel is corrupted because of their defilement, and therefore Israel also cannot now enter the sanctuary. I hope we're together on this. God is explaining what being corrupt means. They can no longer enter the divine presence, follow very closely, friends. In fact, we recognize that in the same verse, uh, we see it, it, in synonymous sort of parallelism, God uses the word also mum. In the, in the Hebrew, the word is translated from the, from the word for blemishes. So if you're looking at Leviticus 22 and verse 25, God uses another word, uh, Leviticus 22 and verse 25. God said there are blemishes in them, their corruption and their blemish is in them. Now, stay closely here and go with me to Leviticus 21 and verse 17. Leviticus 21 and verse 17, and the Bible says, Speak unto Aaron, saying, Whosoever he be of thy seed in their generations that hath any blemish, let him not approach to offer the bread of his God. Now, in speaking of the Levitical, the priesthood, those who are going to come and serve in the sanctuary, God says, if there is any blemish in them, it's the same word that God had used for the sacrificial offerings, that if there is any blemish in them or corruption in them. And interestingly, now God is using the same things in referring to his people. Let's keep reading. God is saying that if they have any of these blemishes, let him not approach to offer the bread of his God. In other words, if a priest has any type of blemish, even he cannot now enter to offer an offering to the Lord in the sanctuary. What's happening? What God is saying is now this priest with these blemishes, he cannot officiate in the sanctuary. Just as an animal with those defects, blemishes, corruption, cannot enter, to, cannot enter into the tabernacle as an offering. What's important to note now is, friends, here, as God is speaking to Israel and calling Israel, pointing out Israel as a people that have become corrupt, God is saying that now because of their moral defects, not because of some physical disability, but because of their moral defilement, Israel has separated themselves from God. They have corrupted themselves like a defiled offering, and hence they cannot come to the sanctuary for they have rejected God and have become like defective animals or disqualified priests who cannot enter the Lord's presence. I, I hope we're together so far. Now, since God was already dwelling among the Israelites, there appeared to be only one solution for the situation. What was the solution going to be? The Lord explains. Exodus 32, verse 9 and 10, the Lord says, the, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, speaking to Moses, he said, Moses, leave me alone, that my wrath will wax hot against them, and that I will, what? I will consume them and I will make of thee a great nation. Serious words. God says, Moses, get out of the way. I'm going to consume these people because of their sins. They have corrupted themselves, worshiping this golden calf. I will step in and I will consume them. Interestingly, the same word is used elsewhere in Exodus chapter 3. You would know the story. Moses is on that mount where, it, where he had seen the burning bush. And notice what God said. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. Now, again, God himself is in that bush speaking to Moses. The bush is burning, but the bush was not getting consumed. It's the same Hebrew word we saw used in Exodus 32. God says, get out of my way. I will consume them. I will destroy them. But in Exodus 3, he was in the bush, but the bush was not getting destroyed. Why is that so? You see, the bush had been sanctified by the Lord's presence. 
That's why it was, even though God was there, the bush wasn't getting consumed. But Israel, on the other hand, had rejected God's presence. They had moved and, and, and just separated themselves from God. And now the very presence that was supposed to keep them holy is now a presence that, is, that will consume them because they have rejected the preserving influence of the very same God. I hope we're together, friends. This was going to be the solution. I'll have to wipe them out, Moses. Sin was in the people. Lord is ready to consume them through his presence. Now, as the account continues in the book of Exodus, Moses steps in to intercede for Israel. And as he comes before God, he presents a, an, an alternative solution. And God is, God is rather, as Moses standing in the gap, God says, all right, Moses, I have an alternate solution to this. And Moses must be excited. So, all right, Lord, let's hear it. Let's hear it. What else can we do to save the people? Here's what God says. God says, okay, Moses, I will send an angel before thee. Follow me. Follow, friends. Follow very closely. God says, Moses, all right, what I'm going to do is I will send an angel before Israel. I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. I'll drive all of them out. But I'll take you to a land flowing with milk and honey. Isn't that what God promised? Sure, I'll take you to the land of Canaan. But I will not go up in the midst of thee, for you are a stiff-necked people, lest I what? Consume, I, I, I might kill you along the way. What is God saying? God is saying, you know what, Moses? Fine, fine. Uh, you know what? I won't kill them. So here's what I'll do. I will send an angel. The angel will guide you. The angel will take you to the promised land. In fact, Moses, I tell you, the angel will drive out all the inhabitants of this, of this pagan land. The parent Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites. This angel will wipe all of them out. He'll take all of them out. And they can take the promised land. I made a promise. I'll keep that promise. Go ahead. They can have the land. But Moses, I am not going to go. This lover is very hurt. I don't know if you understand. This lover is heartbroken. His wife has cheated on him. And he's saying, you know what? She can keep the house. She can keep all the property. I don't want that. But I will not go there. I will send bodyguards. I'll send escorts. They'll clear the way. She'll get what she wants. But she won't get me. She's broken my heart. I will not go, Moses. I will make all of the way, but I will not go. I will remain faithful to the promise made. I made it to Abraham. I will lead Israel in his journey, but I will not go with you. Friends, things had gotten so bad. Listen carefully. Things had gotten so bad that verse 7 says, Moses took the tabernacle, pitched it without the camp, afar off from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation, and it came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord went out into the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. It's a very rough story, friends. It's a rough story. God says, I am not going to be with them. It was so bad that the, even the tabernacle, a tent had to be moved outside. And if, and, and, and if anyone had to meet with God, they had to go outside of the camp to go talk to God. God says, not They've rejected me. I'm moving. It's like, are you noticing this? I mean, if you, if you understand this from a relational standpoint, this wife had been so hard-hearted. She's basically pushed her husband out. She's broken his heart so much. He says, I'll, I'll, I'll sleep outside. I'm not going to stay in this. I'll sleep outside. So God is out there in his tent. He says, if anybody needs to talk to me, they can come. But I can't, I can't stay here. I can't stay here. This is a this is a defiled place, corrupted place, a blemished experience. Oh, it's so powerful, friends, when we pay attention to it. Moses continues to intercede. And he's presenting to God. He's saying, it's like, Lord, um, let, let's talk about a third solution. Lord, if it's, if it's possible, you know, let's, let's, let's talk about a third solution. Well, what was that going to be? And here we read in Exodus 32, 30, it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, you have sinned a great sin. And now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure, I shall make an atonement for your sin. Moses returned unto the Lord and said, oh, this people have sinned a great sin. 
and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written in one of our earlier messages. Perhaps, I think, in fact, if I remember correctly, it was our first message with Rekindled Ministries entitled A Song of Experience, where we spoke of the Song of Moses and the Song of the Lamb. And we spoke of how Moses' request here before God is so much like Jesus' request. Moses was willing to get his own name blotted out of the book of life. He's like, Lord, I'm willing to put my eternal life on the line, but I need this people saved, please. Just like Jesus was, who risked his eternal life to save us from the wretchedness and the degradation, degradation and destruction of sin. So here it is, Moses is presenting a plea to the Lord. Forward in, in, in chapter 33, Moses said to the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, bring up the people and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name. And thou hast also found grace in my sight. But Moses says, Lord, if I, if I pray thee, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now thy way that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight and consider that this nation is your people, Lord. Don't leave us alone. He's pleading on behalf of his nation. And then God says, all right, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. So Moses steps in, intercedes on behalf of Israel. God forgives Israel. But understand, friends, God's, God's, God's acceptance of the intercession is, is giving forgiveness to Israel is not based on the fact that, oh, Moses was a great intercessor. Because the atonement, the forgiveness, is really the result of God's benevolence, his own character, which he speaks of later on. In verse 19 of the same chapter, Exodus 33 rather, and yes, same chapter, and he says, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. I'll proclaim the name of the Lord. I will be gracious to whom I'll be gracious. I'll show mercy on whom I will show mercy. So catch that story. God says, this is what I will do for my people. I will show mercy. I will be gracious. I will proclaim my name. I will do all of this because... Moses, I really want to save them. God's desire was to save his people. His heart was broken. So broken. You can see he's sleeping outside. God is saying, I really want to save my people. I really, really want to save my people. Now that the forgiveness has been accepted, now the covenant could be, and now the covenant was renewed. Moses ascended into Sinai. He witnessed there a beautiful, beautiful, special experience with God. This time Yahweh proclaimed his most holy place, the Yahweh from his, from his most holy place. He, he proclaimed his willingness to forgive his people their iniquity and yet punishing the hard-hearted, high-handed sinner. Listen to the words in Exodus 34, 5, the Lord descended in the cloud, stood with him there, and proclaim the name of the Lord. You can see, you can see God's reconnection, the reconciliation. He's like, all right, I come and I stand in the midst. I proclaim the name. The Lord passed by before him, proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. Notice all of this is in the context of the, the, the unfaithfulness of his wife. But he says, I'll still be faithful. I'll be gracious and long-suffering. But then he says, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And that will by no means clear the guilty. I'll do all of this. But if you hard heartedly reject me, I will by no means clear the guilty. I'll visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children under the third and to the fourth generation. A misunderstood text or what a text that simply means. As fathers, you will teach the same sins to your children. And so. Not that I will punish your children for your sins, but as your children follow your sins, they will, punish this, they will face the same punishment for their sins because they're simply repeating your sins. In the second, third generation, as they keep repeating the sins, they will keep experiencing the judgments. So this is what God is saying. I'll forgive, I'll be gracious. But if hard-heartedly you have gone away and, and rejected me and just after all that I've done, 
then you will have to face the consequences of your own iniquities. Then he said, if now, Moses says, Lord, if now I've found grace in your sight, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us. Lord, please. I mean, this is, this is a separate study altogether. Listen to Moses' heart pleading, God, if you really accepted us, please go with us. Please go. Don't let us go alone. Go with us. For it is a stiff-necked people. Pardon our iniquity and our sin. Take us for thine inheritance, please. And he said, the Lord said, behold, I make a covenant. I want to say, I, I, I will renew the covenant. Israel had just breached it. God says, all right, Moses, I will renew the covenant. Before all thy people, I will do marvels, such as have not done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord, for it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. Isn't it beautiful? Friends, isn't it, just, isn't it just simply, simply beautiful? Isn't it beautiful that as he comes back in a relationship where his wife just cheated him, he doesn't come back with bitterness. In fact, he comes even with a greater thrust of love. And he says, I will do marvels in your midst, such as, such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation, all the people among which thou shalt see the work of the Lord. It is a terrible thing I'll do with thee. I don't come back with bitterness. I come back with even greater evidences of my love for you. I will do a mighty thing. Are you following, friends? Are you following the whole story? It was a place of communion. The original intent. A place where two lovers could meet. The lover had just rescued his bride. He had just married her. He wanted to stay with her, but she went out cheating while he's preparing their house. She went out to cheat. But as she goes out cheating on him, he takes her back. Says, I'll cleanse you. I'll renew you. Stay with me. Proves I love you. I love you. And gives powerful evidences of his love. Stay with me. And because notice a place of communion now, communion could not be possible until the hindrance to the communion would be done away. What's the hindrance? Sin. And hence, atonement had to be done. The forgiveness and sin had to be dealt with in this meeting place so that they could genuinely meet together. He had to remove the obstruction so that he could be united with his bride forever from communion to atonement is the journey of the sanctuary. And this is how, friends, the sanctuary was no longer just a meeting place. It was also the place of atonement. Forgiveness was available. It was now manifest that God was willing to deal with this sin problem so that he could live with his bride forever. Friends, are you learning God's way? This is God's way, God's way to take you in. And in spite of my stubbornness, my waywardness, he says, I want to take you in. I want to take you in. I want to receive you in that you and I can be together forever. It is God's desire, friends. And I pray that you would embrace this desire wholeheartedly. I pray that you will embrace this desire wholeheartedly. I pray that God will minister to you and I pray that he will help you make a decision for Jesus. Choose him, friends. No one, I, I'll say this over and over again, no one loves you like God. After all that we've done, he still seeks to take us back, still seeks to love us, prove to us that he loves us and is committed to us. No one loves us like God. Receive him today, friends. If that is your desire, if you choose to put away everything and just run to Jesus today, saying, God, I want to give you my all. If that is you, join me on your knees, please, as we pray together. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you. Your word is so beautiful, Lord. Your commitment, unspeakable, matchless, powerful, precious. Truly, Lord, no one loves us like you. No one ever can. 
thank you for accepting us the way we are, but not desiring for us to stay the way we are, for you desire to change us, transform us. Pick us up, my Lord, I humbly plead. Pray for my brothers and sisters, their lives, their struggles, their challenges, their difficulties, their besetments, their distractions. I don't know what it is, Lord. I don't know what is hindering their communion. I pray that you would burn everything. That would be an obstacle and a an hindrance. That you will just pull them in from the fields of sin. That they will love, serve, and honor you. Glorify you as they see the God who is love and love forevermore. Thank you, Father. Thank you for loving us the way you do. May your name forever be praised. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Dr. Robin.